بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا Today continuing with Zad al-Mustaqni في اختصار المقنع وفي مام الحجاوي uh, We've reached the chapter pertaining to باب الأذان والإقامة pertaining to the issues of the Adhan and the Iqama <coughs> So what is Adhan? Linguistically Adhan it means a call, an announcement in Surah Tawbah, Allah says, وَأَذَانُ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ إِلَى النَّاسِ يَوْمُ الْحَجِّ الْأَكْبَرِ And Allah is proclaiming a call through His Prophet to the people on the day of Hajj. Okay? Proclaiming that people should come to Hajj. So Adhan linguistically has the meaning of I'lam, to proclaim something. What is it technically? Shaykh Uthaymeen, he says in Sharh Al-Mumta, his explanation of Zad al-Mustaqni, he said, Ta'abudu lillahi ta'ala bil-a'lam bil-dakhuli waqti salah. He said it is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through announcing that the time of prayer has come upon the community. Okay? At-ta'abudu lillahi ta'ala bil-a'lam bil-dakhuli waqti salah. Iqama has the meaning of, it's the mustard from aqam. Aqama yaqumu. And is to make something firm or upright. Okay, that's the meaning of iqama, linguistically. Technical meaning of iqama is to announce to the people that the salah is about to be established. Tayyib. When was the iqama and the adhan established? When the Prophet ﷺ went to Medina in the first year. Okay, so in the times of Makkah, there was no adhan. It took place in Medina in the first year of the Hijrah. The Imam, the author, may Allah bless him, he said, Quma farda kifaya. These two are fard kifaya. What is fard kifaya? What is this definition? What do we mean? Fardun kifayatun. Yeah, what does that mean? It's a communal obligation. What does that mean? Ascent. So if one of... The commun- if one person in the community fulfills this obligation, then the rest are absolved from that obligation. If nobody does it, then everybody is held to account, right? That's what it's mean. That's what the definition is. How did he come to this conclusion? One of the evidences in Bukhari and Muslim and the hadith of Malik ibn Hawarith, radiallahu anhu, the companion, he said, I came to the Prophet ﷺ with a group of my people and we stayed with the Prophet ﷺ for around 20 nights. وَكَانَ رَحِيمًا رَفِيقًا And the Prophet ﷺ, he was very merciful with us and very gentle with us. فَلَمَّا رَأَى شَوْقَنَا إِلَىٰ أَهْلِينَا قَالْ إِرْجِعُوا فَكُونُوا فِيهِمْ So when he saw from us and noticed from us that we are now missing our families and desire to be with our families after 20 nights, he said, go back to them and be amongst them. وَعَلِّمُوهُمْ وَصَلُّوا فَإِذَا حَذَرَتِ الصَّلَاةِ فَلْيُؤَذِّنْ لَكُمْ أَحَدَكُمْ وَلْيَأُمَّكُمْ أَكْبَرُكُمْ And when, when the, go back to them, be amongst them, teach them and pray. When the time of prayer comes, then let one of you make the call to prayer. And the eldest of you should lead you in the salah. So the wajhu dalala, the way of bringing the proof from the hadith, is that clearly the Prophet ﷺ said, one of you make the adhan. Okay? So that's why we said, fard kifaya, that it's obligatory only upon one in the community, uh, if that one person does it. Ala rijal Upon men, he said. Who's it obligatory upon? One person, but it's obligatory upon men. Ibn Hubayra, uh, ta'ala, one of the great Hanbali scholars, he said, اتفقوا على أن الإذان لا يشرع لا يشرع في حقهن ولا يصن Ibn Hubayra, may Allah have mercy upon him, the great faqih, he said, it's been agreed upon that the adhan is not legislated upon women and it's not even sunnah for them, right? It's not legislated, meaning it's not obligatory, nor is it even sunnah, but it's mubah. What do I mean by mubah? mubah? You have to speak loudly, sorry. It's allowed, it's permissible, right? You are allowed to do it if you want to do so. So it's not sunnah, nor is it obligatory, but if they want to do so, they can do it. With what condition? That the voices are concealed from men who are not related to them, right? There shouldn't be any temptation due to the beauty of their voice to men that are not related to them. Al-Muqimin, 
So the author, he says, it's upon a Muslim, and it's upon a man, right? And it's upon the one who is muqim. So the ulama, they give these words, just let me explain them to you. Al-muqim, and before that, al-mustawtin, al-mustawtin, al-muqim, al-musafir. Al-mustawtin is the one who has taken a land as a residence. He lives in that land, okay? Al-muqim is the one who is there for four days or more. Four days or more. Al-musafir is the one who is traveling or is in a place with intention to stay there for less than four days, okay? So who is this adhan obligatory upon? The muqimin, the ones who are uh, either mustawtin or muqimin. As Sheikh Abdul Salam al he said both are intended here in this sentence of the author, okay? Whether you're a resident or you, a complete resident or you're a temporary resident for more than four days. This is the one who the, the adhan is upon. As for the traveler, the adhan is not obligatory upon this person. If he wants to do so, he can go ahead and do so. But it's not an obligation upon them, right? لِصَلَوَاتِ khams al maktuba. What is the adhan for? For the five obligatory prayers. Now here the ulama, they discuss, why did he say لِصَلَوَاتِ khams? He didn't stop there. He said that for the five prayers. But then he said al maktuba For the obligatory ones. Because he mentioned this to include Yawm al because on Yawm al-Jum'ah, Jum'ah is the asl, Jum'ah is the uh, foundation, and Dhuhr is a replacement for Jum'ah. Not Jum'ah is a replacement for Dhuhr, as some people understand, no. Uh, Jum'ah is the asl, and if it's missed, then it's prayed as Dhuhr as a replacement. So the adhan for Jum'ah is also included as being obligatory, right? Upon the community. <clears throat> if one is alone, should the person make the adhan, if you are alone? Huh? Yes, because in Abi Dawood and Ahmed, there's a narration from Uqba ibn Amir radiallahu anhu who said that the Prophet sallallahu said, يَعْجِبُ رَبُّكَ مِنْ رَائِنْ عَلَىٰ رَأْسِ شَوْضِئَةِ لِلْجَبَلِ يُؤَذِّنُ وَيُصَلِّ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is amazed and pleased with a, a, a goat herder or a shepherd who is on the edge of a cliff. Right? On a mountain, top of a mountain. He makes the adhan and he prays. So Allah Azawajal is very impressed by him and pleased by him in a way that befits Allah's majesty. He's amazed by him. The hadith goes on to say, the Prophet Sallallahu said that Allah says, Unduru ila abdi. Look to my slave. He's, he's talking to the angels. He's showing off to the angels. Look to my slave. Right? Yu'adhinu wa yuqimu as salah Yakhafu minni. Look at my slave. He is making the adhan and the iqama and praying out of fear of me. Be witness that I have forgiven him and entered him to Jannah. So based upon this hadith and others, they say that there's so much virtue in making the adhan and one should not miss out on it, even if the person is by himself. Right? Make the adhan, the rewards in them are so much, even if you are by yourself. He says... وَيُقَاتَلُوا أَهْلُ بَلَدٍ تَرَكُوهُمَا And the community of a place is fought against by the authority if they choose to leave off performing these two symbols of Islam. The Adhan and the Iqama. Okay? Why? Because in Bukhari Muslim, it's narrated, <coughs> excuse me, كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم إِذَا غَزَّ قَوْمًا لَمْ يُغِرْ حَتَّى يُصْبِحْ فَإِنْ سَمِعَ أَذَانْ أَمْسَكْ the Prophet وسلم, if he would be in a battalion that was uh, a raiding party against the people, he wouldn't do so until morning had come. If he heard the adhan from them, he would leave them alone and move on. If he didn't hear the adhan, he would come upon them after they had woken up, right? So the point being here is that if a people leave off the adhan and the iqama, both of them, then they are to be taken into account seriously, in a serious manner, okay? If they refuse to do that, the adhan of the qama, because these are symbols of Islam that have to be established in the community. He says, ujratuhuma, And it's forbidden for the, for the one who is doing the adhan or the qama to take payment for that. What he means by payment here, he means a contractual payment, okay? A contractual payment with the people of the masjid. Where he says, I'm not going to make the adhan, I'm not going to make the adhan 
unless you pay me X, Y, and Z. This is not permitted. لا رزق من بيت المال لعدم متطوع But it's permitted for him to take money from the authority, from the Muslim treasury. If the Muslim treasury, because there's no one who is volunteering, wants to appoint somebody in the masjid as a regular to make the adhan and the iqama, they can give money to that person to do so. But the person himself cannot stipulate to, to the community that you have to give me money to make the adhan. Because the Hanbali scholars, they have a qaida with them is that acts of worship, you are not allowed to take money for them. You're not allowed to take money for them from the people. That I'm not going to do this unless I'm paid. There's other ways of paying the person, but the contractual type, they say it's not allowed to, to take place. Tayyib? Because this takes away from the person's ikhlas, they say, and uh, it saves the money of the Muslims. And also in the hadith in Abi Dawood, and tell me that the Prophet ﷺ advised one of the companions, he said, وَاتَّخِذْ مُؤَذِّنًا لَا يَأْخُذْ عَلَى أَذَانِهِ أَجْرًا And take a mu'adhin who doesn't ask for payment for his adhan. This was the advice of the Prophet ﷺ to one of the companions in Abi Dawood in Tilbati. He says, وَيَكُونُ الْمُؤَذِّنُ صَيِّتًا And it's highly recommended that the one who's making adhan is sayyid. Sayyitan, this word, they mean that the person has a good, loud voice and it sounds good. Not like a shrieking cat, right? So sometimes you hear the adhan, it's just a terrible adhan, the sound of the adhan. The adhan should be melodious in a controlled way and it should be loud and the person should try, should try to have a good voice. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ, he would gather companions together and check their adhan. And he would choose from amongst them those who had a strong voice and those who had a good voice. Okay? Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Mutlaq Jasr, in his explanation, he said the Prophet ﷺ would go to huge lengths to try to encourage people to come to the masjid. Right? So from that is choosing somebody who has a good voice. So that when they hear that good voice, they're encouraged, they want to come to the masjid and pray behind such people. So he says the person, it's recommended highly that the person has a loud voice and a good voice. Aminan alim al bil He says the person has to be trustworthy and knows the times. Why do you think he said he has to be trustworthy? Why is the person having to be trustworthy? So first and foremost, so that we trust him with the time, right? He needs to know the times. And think about the olden times now when there wasn't electricity, etc. How would they make the adhan? They would be high up, right? So they would be able to look into their neighbors' houses if they wanted to do so, to look into the people's houses. So that's why he had to be trustworthy. Trustworthy of deen, not to be looking into people's private uh, properties, etc. And as well as the brother said, that he should know the times. However, is knowing the time a condition? Do you think? Yes, it's, you're correct. It's not a condition, but why? He could be informed, like who was informed from the companions of the Mu'adhin, the, the ones who would make Adhan for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ibn Maktoum, right? He was blind, he didn't know. So people would tell him that the time for the prayer has come in. Tayyib? Very good. فَإِن تَشَحَّ فِيهِ إِثْنَانِ Now, if there's two people, they want, they want to make the Adhan, both of them, right? And they really want to go for it, they want to make the Adhan. They're not leaving it off. What do you do? He says, قُدِّمَا أَفْضَلَهُمَا fi." He said, the one who is best in making the adhan will be given preference. Now, if they're both very good in making the adhan, you can't differentiate that way. What does he say? He says, ثُمَّ أَفْضَلَهُمَا fi دِينِهِ وَعَقْلِهِ Then the best of them in their religion and their intelligence. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, إِنَّ أَكْرَمَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهِ أَتْقَاكُمْ That the most virtuous of you in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has the most taqwa. So taqwa is something very virtuous and the one who has it is the one who is to be preferred with doing the good deed if there arises a situation where more than one person is pushing to do that good deed. Who we give preference to? If we can't distinguish through other factors, we end up the one who has the most taqwa, he will do it inshallah. And also we mentioned that the person should have aql should have intelligence, right? The ulama, they say this, why? Because the mu'adhin generally is dealing with the community in the masjid. And you have a lot of strange characters in the masjid, right? As you guys know. 
Some people come with very strange behavior, strange ideas, and lots of strange things can take place. So the Mu'addin, if he's got intelligence, he'll, be, he'll know how to interact with people. He'll know how to calm situations down. He'll know how to bring a good solution from any situations that may arise. So therefore, it's imperative that he has aql also. Then he says, even after all of these steps, if a solution cannot be found, what do you do? ثُمَّ مَنْ يَخْتَارُهُ الْجِيرَانِ Then you go to this step of the locals of that masjid. They are the ones who are going to be given the choice. Why? Because they are the ones who are going to be affected by the mu'adhan, right? By the choice of the mu'adhan. So after going through those steps that the imam mentioned, if it cannot be chosen, then the final say will be to the people who pray regularly in that masjid. They will have the, the chance to choose who should be the mu'adhan. Then he says, ثُمَّ قُرْعَةً Even now, amongst the group in the masjid, they cannot choose. What do they do? They make qur'ah. They draw lots, right? Because in Bukhari Muslim, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, لَوْ يَعْلَمُ النَّاسِ مَا فِي النِّدَاءِ وَصَفِّ الْأَوَّلِ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَجِدُوا إِلَّا إِنْ يَسْتَحِمُوا عَلَيْهِ لَسْتَهَمُوا Had the people known what was contained in virtues from making the adhan and being in the front row in the masjid, and yani had they known these virtues and they couldn't get to those virtues, okay, except by drawing lots, then they would have gone ahead and drawn lots. Not like many of us, right? You know the way we're brought up is that you're praying in the first row, somebody taps you on the shoulder and he wants to get into that first row. So you step back and you give him your virtue. La la la, the companions and Islam teachers us don't do that. If it's a virtue, if it's to do with reward, you hold on to it with your molar teeth. You want to put yourself forward for that virtue. You push yourself forward for that virtue. So that's what the hadith is saying and that's what the imam is saying to us. That if now these two who want to make the adhan it still cannot be solved, then at the end of it, lots will be drawn. Okay? It could be drawn by writing a name or any other way. So you shouldn't give up on the chance of reward. Also, the author, he says, وَهُوَ خَمْسَ عَشْرَةَ جُمَلَةً It is 15 sentences. 15 sentences. This is the hadith of Bilal, the adhan of Bilal radiallahu anhu. You also have the famous adhan of uh, Abu, Abu Mahdhura, which is an adhan of 19 sentences, right? So 15 is the hadith of Bilal, which we know, which we are accustomed to. But there's also the adhan of Abu Mahdhura, which is 19. Tayyib. He says, yuratiluha. The adhan should be made with tartil. It's recommended that it's made with tartil. Ay yatamahal fi adaihi. That the person should take it easy when making the adhan, he shouldn't rush it. He should be fairly slow in doing so. And he should pause upon every sentence from those 15 sentences. So it's not like Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. It's not that. It's Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Like this, right? You stop on every sentence. This is the way that our author is saying that it should be done. However, if you do it the other way that I did in the first, when you join the sentences, it's permissible. But preferred is to stop on every sentence. Tayyib. He says, uh, that the adhan should be made from a high place. So if we're in a place where there's no electricity, no microphones, you make it in a high place so that the sound can travel further, right? As, the, as, as it's done and it was done in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and it's still done in those places that don't have electricity. Mutatahiran. It's highly recommended that the person has tahara. Which tahara? Which tahara? Al akbar or al asgar? Huh? Both of them, huh? With regards to the adhan, it's al akbar. Okay? Hadith al akbar. Sorry, both are recommended, like we said. Both are highly recommended. But if the person has hadith al akbar, that which requires uh, wusl, then it's makru for him to make the adhan. Okay? Because he has to go away and make wusl, etc. He may be delayed for the salah. Whereas if he's got hadith al asgar that which requires wudu, it's okay for him to make the adhan. There's no kiraha there. Tayyib? But with regards to the iqama, both of the states of hadith are makru if the person has it. Because the time is very little between making the iqama and the salah. Tayyib? As mentioned by Sheikh Abdul Salam al Shawair in his explanation. He says, Mustaqbil al-Qibla, the person should face towards the Qibla, right? 
the first person should face towards the Qibla because it's virtuous in general that all acts of worship are done towards the Qibla Re reciting Quran uh, reading uh, making dua making the adhan this is something which is highly recommended okay and of course when you pray then it's a must that you have to be towards the Qibla interestingly Imam Ahmad may Allah have mercy upon him and Ibn Taymi ta they also said when the person is making the adhan they should raise their head towards the sky okay as an interesting side point so he's facing the Qibla and also raises his head up when he's making the Adhan. The author, Al-Hajjawi, he says, Ja'ilan usbu'ayhi aw usbu'ayhi fi udhanayhi. He puts his two fingers into his ears because this is what was reported in Tirmidhi from the hadith of Abi Juhayfa that Bilal radiyallahu anhu used to do this. He would put a finger in each ear. Which finger would he put in his ears? The Sababa, known as the Sababa. Okay, the Sababa. And they say, what do you think the wisdom is behind doing that? Putting your finger in your ears. They say it makes your voice louder. I don't know if that's true, but they say it makes your voice louder. And also from a distance, somebody knows what you're doing. Okay, when you have your fingers in your ear like that, they can tell straight away, okay, that person is making the adhan. Unless he's one of the crazy people, right? <laughs> so, so they know what's going on. Ghayra Mustadir. He says... The person when he's making the adhan, he shouldn't be turning to the left and the right, right and the left, or a full 360. What, what does he mean not turning to the left and the right? He means the body. The body shouldn't be turning away from facing the qibla. Because some people used to do this in the absence of microphones to try to ensure that everyone can hear the sound, they will turn around in a full circle. He's saying this is not to be done. Rather the person stays facing the Qibla Multafitan fil hay alati yaminan wa shimalan When he makes the hay ala Hayya ala salati And hayya ala al-fala He turns to the right And left Right So what does he mean turning here? Not turning the body Turning off the head Tayyib Sheikh Abdul Salam Al-Shawayr He says that this turning is of two types He said you can say Hayya ala salah Hayya ala salah so what have I done? I've done one on each side, right? Or you can do it, two on one side and two on the other side, which we are accustomed today in our times, right? So he said you can do it either way. And he said in fact that the Mu'atamad, the uh, relied upon opinion of the later Hanbali scholars, is to do two on one side and two on the other side. The intention was to read the sound to the people. Exactly. Ascent, very good. Mm -hmm. Beautiful point, Zakallah. So, like the brothers mentioned, that there's also that the intention was to reach the sound to the people, right? So now you have the microphone. If you turn away from the microphone, your sound is getting less. So it's detrimental. Some scholars they agree with you. They say yes. Some scholars say no. We're going to stick to what the Prophet ﷺ was pleased with. The Prophet ﷺ was pleased with the action from the companions. So we're going to stick to it. So there's leeway, whatever the people see better, inshallah. Uh, the author, he says Saying after the hay'ala In the morning adhan As-salatu khayrun min al As-salatu khayrun min al That prayer is more virtuous than sleep It should be said very loudly, right? Because most of us are sleeping uh, Prayer, meaning the morning prayer Is more virtuous than sleep So this is said after the hay'ala when it's finished, then you say this twice, okay? After Hayy al filah It's known as Tathweeb. I asked Sheikh Hazim, Hafidullah, what is the meaning of Tathweeb? He asked one of his colleagues, and they said the meaning of Tathweeb is that an announcement is given to do something with a loud voice. So what is the announcement here? You're announcing to the people to get up and pray. Prayer is better than sleep, right? And also the second meaning of Tathweeb is that announcement is made to ask people to do something quickly. So it has two meanings. One is that it's, it's a loud announcement, asking people to do something. The second is that also it means that the people should do it quickly. And we know that this announcement is very important because praying Fajr in Jama'ah, where the Fajr should be prayed for men, is something very virtuous. Don't leave it off. Force yourself to sleep early if you're having problems getting up for Fajr. Get to the masjid and pray in Jama'ah. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, Man salla subh fil jama'ah fa innahu fi dhimmatillah. 
Listen to these words. Whoever prays the congregation prayer, meaning the morning prayer, with the people in congregation, then he is in the protection of Allah for that day. Negativity is just going to bounce off of you because you prayed Fajr in Jama'ah. Don't lose out on that reward. And also the Prophet وسلم, he used to say that the heaviest prayer upon the Munafiq, the hypocrite, is the Isha prayer and the Fajr prayer in the congregation. So if you find yourself unable to get to the congregation, then check yourself. It's a serious issue. He says, وَهِيَ إِحْدَى أَشْرَى The iqama is 11 sentences, right? The iqama is 11 sentences. And this is the uh, iqama of Bilal. And the iqama of Abi Mahdura is 17 sentences. Okay? What is the iqama of Bilal? Tell me. What is the iqama? How can it be 11 sentences? Yes, so start from the beginning and say it. Was that right? That's right. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadan Rasulullah. Hayya la salati, hayya la falah. Qad qamat al-salah, qad qamat al-salah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah. Eleven, right? But if you do the adhan, as chosen by the Hanafi scholars, you do the adhan, the 15 sentences, and you add qad qamat al-salah, qad qamat al-salah, that is fine, inshallah. But our author and the opinion here of the Hanbali scholars, they're saying, it's uh, 11 sentences. And how do you make the iqama? وَيَحْدُرُهَا وَيَحْدُرُهَا You make the iqama quickly. Why do you make the iqama quickly? Huh? Why do you make the iqama quickly? Because it's more appropriate than the adhan is made long, right? Because the iqama people are ready. They're there waiting to pray. So it's more appropriate for the situation that you make it quickly, right? But still, if you can, stop on each sentence. وَيَقِيمُ مَنْ أَذَّنْ And the one who should make the iqama, if possible, is the same person who made the adhan. Because this was what Bilal radiyallahu anhu used to do. فِي مَكَانِهِ إِنْ سَهُولًا In the same place that he made the adhan, if it's easy to do so. So maybe that person made the adhan outside the masjid, on top of the building. Then he should do it in the same place if it's easy to do so. In fact, Bilal radiallahu anhu used to say, don't get to Amin before I get to you. So you can imagine from Surah Al-Fatiha, he's rushing down from wherever he made the Adhan to try to catch the Amin, right? And so it means that he would be away from where the uh, Iqamah is made. But also at times, he used to make the Iqamah at the door of the Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the Adhan at the door of the Prophet, uh, Masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's not necessity that it has to be far away and the iqama can be done inside if wanting to do so. So the iqama used to be made at the door of the Prophet ﷺ. Okay. And the iqama is not correct or the adhan except that it's murattab, except that it's done in the order that which it came with. You cannot change the sentences around, right? Because once the Prophet ﷺ has accepted something from the companions, that is more virtuous to us than anyone who thinks of any other ideas of doing an act of worship in a different way. طيب? So it cannot be accepted except مرتباً. متوالياً. متوالياً is that it should be uh, consecutively. That each sentence follows the next sentence. There shouldn't be a huge gap in between. If there's a huge gap in between, Right? Then it's not going to be accepted. What is this gap in between? How do they define this? They say it goes back to the urf. You've heard me use the word urf before. Urf is the customarily norms. So if customarily in a community they say that that gap is too much, then that's what is accepted. Sheikh Mutlaq Jasr in his explanation, he said, other scholars, they said that it goes back to what is muwalat in wudu. You remember in Kitab Tahara, we mentioned something which is muwalat of wudu. That each body limb, you have to reach the next body limb in wudu before the previous body limb dries in a normal weather situation. So they say that normally takes about 10 minutes. So that is what is accepted here in the adhan. Okay? The period of muwalat in wudu is what is accepted in the adhan. So if a person has a pause in the adhan, which is around 10 minutes, then the humble scholars are saying that that is acceptable. Right? 
But again, we say urf also takes precedence. So your urf may be even 10 seconds. You, you know, slapping the mu'adhin, what are you doing? Why are you having this big uh, break for? So it depends upon these two things, the urf and the, uh, the definition of the mu'alat. So this adhan in the iqama, it should be made min adlin, he says, from a just person. And what they mean by just person is that he has good religion. So not like somebody who openly shaves his beard or somebody who's openly smoking, somebody who's openly doing disobedience to Allah Why do you think? Why do you think? Maybe accepted as a norm then, I guess. Somebody who's, you know, a beard. to do with acceptance, maybe, right? That the more virtuous the person is, that the more acceptance there's going to be, right? Also, it's to do with, we don't want to push people forward as an example that are openly disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Which is taking place today in social media. Our examples are those who are actually making the effort to follow the, the sharia to the best of their ability. That is the one who's pushed as an example to follow, right? Not the one who's openly disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also the Prophet said in the hadith in Ahmad and Abi Dawood, Al Imam Daminun wal Mu'addin wal Mu'addinu Mu'taman. That the Imam is their guarantor, he guarantees your prayer for you. And the Mu'addin is the one who is trusted. Right? The, mu- the Mu'addin is the one who is trusted. So the trustworthy person includes also religion, having religious outwardly practice. Okay, so the Fasiq, the open disobedient person, is not given such a responsibility. However, if he does it, then it's accepted according to one of the riwaya, one of the narrations from the Madhab of Ahmad, and to the majority. They say if it's done, it's accepted. Walau mulahanan. He says, even if it's mulahan. So if a person makes the adhan and he does this thing what I'm going to explain to you now, even if he does this, then the adhan will still be accepted. But it shouldn't be there. But if he goes ahead and does it, then it's still accepted. That's what the phrase means. Walau mulahan. Talheen in the adhan is makru, is to extend the, the uh, adhan, the words beyond what is the norm in Arabic. So in Arabic you have mudud, right? You have extensions which can be two, four, six, etc. Six being the highest. But if you go beyond that, then it's something which is makru. It's disliked, right? It's known as dalhin, and uh, also to do it with maqamat, which is uh, like singing. Okay, having a melody to it which is not natural. You you're going beyond the the norm. Okay, so this is what the ulama mean. Don't try to make it like singing. Do it naturally, the adhan. If you have a beautiful voice, alhamdulillah, it's well and good. But don't go beyond that. Try to extend it beyond what it should be and, and make, it more melod- uh, make it more like singing of some sort. Then he says, أو or if it has lahan. أو malhunan. Lahan is that you go against the rules of the Arabic, the grammar rules, etc. For example, instead of saying Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, you say Allah Akbar. Right? So you've gone against the rule now. You've put, instead of putting a dhamma, you put a fatha. Right? Allah Akbar. They say this is makru, but it's permissible. However, if the mistake changes the meaning, some people they say this, they say Allahu Akbar. Does anybody know what the problem is with that? Huh? Ahsan, you've made it istifham. You made it, Hamza al-Istifham, you made it a question. Ah, uh, this is a question. Okay? <laughs> like in the hadith, uh, Allahu amraka bihada. Did Allah order you to do so? So when that alif is extended, it becomes a question instead of a statement. So this is something which will not be accepted, right? So the person has to really uh, be tested in making the adhan and somebody who's able to make the adhan. In fact, I've heard so many people make adhan incorrectly. The person himself should be wary of that. I'm doing an act of worship on behalf of the community. Let me go and check with somebody who knows. Am I able to make the adhan? Do I have the ability? He should check, right? And he says, min mumayiz, That the adhan is permitted if a mumayyiz does it. Mumayyiz is somebody at the age of seven, right? Because in the hadith in Bukhari, Amr ibn Salama, he said, I prayed with my people at the age of seven. He was seven years old and he led his people into salah. So the mumayyiz in this situation, he's allowed to make the adhan if there's nobody else uh, to make the adhan properly. If nobody else can do it, he can do it. So they say that the mumayyiz has a niyyah, but his niyyah is qasira. His niyyah is 
not complete, right? But he has a niyyah, though it's not complete. It's not kamil. وَيُبْطِلُهُمَا فَصْلٌ كَثِيرٌ وَيُصِيرٌ مُحَرَّمٌ And if there's a fasl, a long gap in between the sentences of the adhan or the iqama, it will make the iqama or the adhan invalid. Or if there's a small gap, which has something in there which is haram. Let me explain this. So if there's a long gap of silence between the uh, sentences of the adhan or the iqama, this will invalidate, right? Now, if there's a small gap, it's okay. However, if in that small gap, speech is used which is impermissible, then it will invalidate the adhan or the iqama. What can be impermissible speech? Like he, something happens and he swears at somebody. Something happens and for some reason he backbites somebody. He, something comes to his mind, right? He stops and he backbites somebody next to him. He tells him, oh, you know such and such is like this. So this would invalidate because why? He's mentioned speech in the adhan which is impermissible, right? So two things, if the gap is long, it invalidates. If the gap is short, it doesn't invalidate unless it has words contained in that gap which are impermissible. Also, if there's a gap, small one, where there shouldn't be a gap, okay? Like you say, for example, la ilah, and then you stop. And then you say, ha illallah. That's not acceptable. With that sentence, it has to be together, right? So if there's a gap, which is done, it's small, but it's done in an impermissible way, like I just mentioned, then that is not accepted either, as mentioned by Sheikh Abdul Salam al-Shawayr. وَلَا يُجْزِئُوا قَبْلَ الْوَقْتِ The adhan is not accepted before time. You're thinking, oh, that's obvious, right? Why do we even mention this? The adhan is not accepted before the time. But then he says, إِلَّا الْفَجَرُ بَعْدُ النِّصْفُ الْلَيْلِ Except for fajr, after half of the night has passed. So he's saying here, for the fajr adhan, you can make it before the time. Before the time is after half of the night has passed, right? In Bukhari and Muslim, in the hadith of Ibn Umar, he said, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, Inna Bilal yu'adhinu bil-layl fakulu wa shrabu hatta yu'adhinu ibn ummi maktum. That very Bilal, he makes the adhan in the night, meaning before the time. So eat and drink until Ibn Umm Maktum makes the adhan, the actual adhan for Fajr. In some places, they have two adhans for Fajr. They have one adhan which is before the time. That's generally to wake people up to tell them to stop praying Qiyamah Layl if they're doing so, and to start getting ready for wudu, for Fajr. And then the second Adhan is given at the time when the Adhan of Fajr comes in. Okay, this is a scenario. But what the author is talking about, he's not talking about this. He's saying even if you did the second Adhan before the time of Fajr, it's permissible. You understand? He's saying even if you did that second Adhan before the time of Fajr, it's permissible. طيب. And it's it's sunnah that the person sits after the adhan of Maghrib for a short while. What did he say? Tell me. Sits, right? Keep that in your mind. Sits. In the hadith in Bukhari Muslim, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Sallu qabl al maghribi Sallu qabl al-maghribi liman sha. Sallu qabl al-maghribi raka'atayn liman sha. The Prophet sallallahu said, pray before maghrib to raka for the one who wishes to do so. Okay? Hadith in Bukhari Muslim. But the humbly scholars, they say that this salah is not pertaining to two uh, units of prayer between the adhan and the iqamah of maghrib. They say there is no salah between the adhan and the iqamah, the humbly scholars. They say it's not recommended, nor is it sunnah. It's not sunnah, nor is it even recommended. But they say it's mubah, it's permitted. If somebody wants to do it as a nafil mutlaq, it's permitted. They say what sunnah is if somebody wants to make the sunnah of wudu, for example, or tahayyat al-masjid, or salat al-istikhara, these kind of things. But the sunnah of between the adhan and the maghrib, they say it's not sunnah. Okay? That's their opinion. That's why the author mentioned sit. He didn't mention uh, pray the two raka'ah. He said, sit, right? وَمَنْ جَمَعَ أَوْ قَدَّ فَوَائِتَ أَذَّنَ لِأُولَى Whoever is joining the prayers, right? Like a traveler or a sick person, you join the prayers that you're allowed to join, or he is making up the ones that he missed, 
Okay, then he gives the adhan for the first one. So he has a group of prayers that he's joining or a group of prayers that he needs to make up. He gives the adhan for the first one only. And then for each time he's praying, for each obligatory one he's praying, he gives the iqamah. Okay? So somebody's traveling or making, joining two salah due to sickness or whatever. The first, the one adhan is given and then for each salah you give one iqamah. So for the second salah that you're praying, you don't need to give the iqamah. If you're doing more than second salah, because you had three or four to make up, maybe you were a doctor and you had a 20-hour operation that you couldn't get away from, that you were uh, carrying out, then in that situation, you would, when you make up the prayers, you make one adhan and iqamah for each of the prayers. However, if you're in a place where you heard the adhan, you don't have to make the adhan, okay? Thank you. وَيُسَنُّوا لِسَامِئِهِ مُتَابَعَتُهُ سِرًّا And it's sunnah for the one who hears the adhan to follow it quietly. Okay, in Sahih Muslim, the Prophet said in the hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, إِذَا سَمِعْتُ الْمُؤَذِّنْ فَقُولُوا مِثْلُ مَا يَقُولُ If you hear the adhan, then say like the mu'adhin is saying. So you get the same rewards. And also there's another benefit. What is the other benefit? Apart from you getting reward like the mu'adhin or similar to the mu'adhin, what is another benefit of you repeating the adhan? It's making you psychologically ready for your prayer. You're thinking of the words, okay? You're enjoying what the adhan is saying to you. So that's helping you to prepare for the salah. So the repetition, it should be quietly as most dhikr is done quietly, right? Unless it's for ta'lim. If you're doing it for ta'lim, you can do it loudly. Does the repetition include the iqama? Do we repeat the iqama also? Or is that only for the adhan? What do you think? You can do so because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, بَيْنَ كُلِّ أَذَانَيْنْ صَلَاةٍ Between two, between each two adhans, there is a prayer. So he called the adhan and he also called the iqama adhan. Right? So it fits back into the general hadith that we just mentioned. Whenever you hear the mu'adhin making the call, then repeat after him. So the iqama fits into that uh, category also. Should you repeat the adhan that you hear on the TV or the radio? If you can't hear it outside, then you could do it. Anyone else? You should do Anyone else? You don't think so? Why don't you think so? If you don't mind me asking. Good point. Yeah. So the, what the ulama, they say, if it's adhan mubashir, if it's not a recorded adhan, if it's a live adhan, then you should repeat after it with two qaid. Qaid literally means like condition or, or restrictions, right? With two qayud, qaidain. First of them being that um, you are in the time zone of the adhan, like the brother mentioned. The adhan could be different to your time zone, right? So it's, you don't repeat it. The second thing is that you haven't already prayed the salah for that time. If you've already prayed the salah for that time, then the adhan is not haq for you. It's not in your uh, legislation for you to repeat it. Tayyib? Can you repeat more than one adhan? Should you repeat more than one adhan? I went to Pakistan once and it was the strangest experience. There was like, in one village, there was like in such a close proximity, there was just adhan after adhan after adhan after adhan. Here is similar also, you have so many adhans, right? What should you do? Should you repeat? What do you think? Only once. Only once, huh? Otherwise your wife will get upset with you. What's wrong with you? Keep repeating. No, the ulama, they say, you repeat as much as you want, right? You repeat as much as you want. It's mustahab to do so. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, he said this, in al-ikhtiyarat. In his book, al ikhtiyarat okay? He said you can repeat. Should you repeat the adhan whilst in salah? If you're in the prayer, should you repeat the adhan? The madhab, the alhamdulillah scholars, they said no. Ibn Taymiyyah said, he said it's even recommended to repeat in the adhan due to the general evidences. What should you do if you're in the bathroom and the adhan is taking place? Huh? Do it in your heart. That's not repeating really, is it? Sent. This is what some of the ulama they say. They say the humble scholars. They say make qadha of the adhan when you come outside. I was going to make a silly joke there, but anyway. once you've come outside, make the qadha of the adhan. This is what they say. Or they say that um, Ibn Taymiyyah he said even in that situation you can repeat the adhan. But the uh, Allah alim the uh, who am I to say? But maybe the better opinion maybe is not to, of course, right? 
But who am I to say? If a, if a great Imam like Ibn Taymiyyah said it's permissible, who am I to say no? But the one which fits better, maybe, is not to do so. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنِّي كَرِهْتُ أَنْ أَذْكُرُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى إِلَّا عَلَى تُهْرٍ I dislike to mention Allah's name unless I'm in a state of purity, right? This is what the Prophet ﷺ said. So the Hanbali scholars, in general, they said don't do so. The Imam, the author, he says, وَحَوْقَلَتْهُمْ فِي الْحَيْئَلَى Okay, you make the hawqala. Anybody know what the hawqala is? Take a guess, hawqala, what does it sound like? Asantum, la hawla wa la quwata illa billahil al amiyu la azim, right? To say this uh, after the hay'ala. When you hear any of the hay'ala, hay'ala salah, you say la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. You, you hear hay'ala falah, you say hay'ala falah, you say la hawla wa la quwata illa billah. Why? What's the amazing benefit here? There's an amazing benefit. Do you know, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah means there is no power or movement except by the permission of Allah Azza wa right? So when you hear the adhan which is calling you to virtue, the most virtuous deed, you're reminding yourself that I cannot do any virtuous deed unless Allah gives me from his power to do so. It is only with Allah's gifts that we go to do these virtuous deeds. So the person is reminding himself that when I'm being called to this beautiful act of worship, I say, la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. This can only take place by Allah's permission. And it's a gift to me from Allah that I'm responding to the adhan, going there, right? The author, he says, and after the adhan has been called, he makes this statement. He said, Allahumma rabba hadhi da'wati tamma wa salati al-qa'ima ati muhammadin al-wasilata wal-fadilata wab'athu maqam al-mahmuda alladhi wa'adtahu. Okay, this is mentioned in the hadith of Bukhari. And at the end of it, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever says this, hallat lahu shafa'ati yawm al-qiyamah. Whoever says this, then, his inter- then my intercession becomes upon him on the day of judgment, right? Notice I didn't say it. لا تخلف الميعاد. إنك لا تخلف الميعاد. Many of us are used to it. Many of the hadith scholars, they said that this is not authentic. But if somebody finds it to be authentic because he's following a particular group of hadith scholars, okay. But many of them, they said it's not authentic. طيب. What else is virtuous after hearing the adhan? Right? So we say this dua, what else is virtuous after hearing the adhan? Hmm. Hadith? Huh? Hadith? Something, whether it's a hadith or what is virtuous to do after hearing the adhan. So I gave you one thing which is virtuous. The author said to, to say this dua, right? Huh? Salawat upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? To make salawat upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to say some of the other dhikr which are there, Ridditu billahi rabban wal islami deenan, wa bi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam nabiya, and make dua. Type. If a group has come to a masjid, the adhan has been given, right? Maybe the people have prayed, the people have prayed already, but the adhan was given there. Should they go ahead and give a second adhan when they go to pray? When they make a second jama'ah? They should not give some, right? The humble scholars, they say it's up to them. They have the khiyar. They have the choice. Whether they want to give the adhan or they don't want to give the adhan. So it's not something we are telling the people you have to do. It's their choice, which the humble scholars are saying, right? The iqamah they have to, right? The iqamah they have to. So say, for example, some masjids, the people may not like it that you're giving a second adhan. If you know that the case, leave it off. Rather than cause the argumentation between the people, right? Joining of the heart is something which is very... Uh, sought after all the time. If you can leave something off to keep the hearts united, you leave it off, right? And then you teach the people later. Did you want to say something? Yeah. Hmm. So the adhan was done and the prayer was done. Yeah. That's done. But then another group of people came. Maybe they were traveling. They stopped at this masjid. So the question was, do they make a second? Do they make an adhan, right? And so. If you want to think like that, yeah, it was Fadl Kifaya, it's already done, so they don't have to do it. It's not incumbent upon them, right? So the ulama, they're saying if they want to do it, they can do it, but it's not incumbent. Tayyip, the adhan has been made, can a person leave the masjid? Should be able to, yeah. Should be able to, isn't it? Yeah. Abu Harir radiallahu anhu, in Sahil Muslim, he was in the masjid. He saw a person whilst the adhan was being made, walking from one side of the masjid to leave the door and he was following him with his eyesight all the way and when he left he said Amma hadha faqad asa Abu al-Qasim he says as for this one he disobeyed Abu al-Qasim meaning Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
So it's not allowed for the person to leave after the adhan has been called or during the adhan has been called, right? Because now it's incumbent upon you to pray that prayer in the masjid. There's exceptions. What are the exceptions to this? If there's an emergency, taban the sharia is very beautiful, very relaxed, you can leave. What else? If you're going to another masjid and you're sure he's going to get there, he can also do so. If he wants to return to the masjid, then he's also allowed to do so. This is what we had to say, inshallah, pertaining to today's topic. Anything which was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mistakes and shortcomings were for myself and shaitan. I ask Allah wa to make this small deed heavy in our scale of good deeds on the day of judgment. Ameen. And to give us fiqh of this deen and implementation of this deen. If you have any questions, then feel free, inshallah.